Hi, I'm Larry Peabody. When someone asks me what I do, I often say, well, I teach the theology of work online for the Baki Graduate University. But when I say those words, sometimes I get the feeling I might as well have stated my point in ancient Greek or Swahili. First, although the Baki Graduate University, or BGU as we call it, equips Christians around the world in transformational leadership, very few have ever heard of the school. Second, the term theology of work usually draws a blank stare. What God says about our daily work is vitally important for countless Christ followers who over their lifetime spend 80 to 100,000 hours on the job. But although the truth of, about our work has been in scripture for thousands of years, it seems to have been hidden in plain sight. Third, many have had no experience with taking courses in an online classroom. They have no idea how today's technology has turned the internet into a very effective tool for instruction, even at the graduate level. I hope this video will introduce you to all three, to BGU, to the theology of work, and to the online classroom experience. In a recent online class session, we spent time with David Haytag, owner and president of Edgerton Gear in Edgerton, Wisconsin. He's also the author of the soon to be published book, Gears and God, A Quest for True Inner Goodness in the Workplace. As a BGU graduate who is practicing the theology of work in a real business and workplace setting, his story is riveting. Our, our online session with David was recorded, including his interaction with a few members of the class. In this video, you will see and hear excerpts from that session. Enjoy. I want to give you an idea of what a machine shop looks like if some of you have never been uh, in a gear shop before. Hi, welcome to Edgerton Gear. We make custom gears for people all over the country and even the world. Come on back and we'll give you a tour. The entire process starts with raw material arriving as bar stock from various companies around the area. The crane unloads the bars to be stored until needed. A saw cuts the raw material to the length specified. We machine iron, steel, stainless steel, and plastics to make our gears. We use blueprints our customers provide to make the gears. This is the lathe operation where the part spins and the tool moves to cut material away. Here you can see a hole is drilled, cut to size, then flipped over to finish the other side. We then cut the part to a finished length and turn the outside diameter down to make a hub per the print specifications. A lathe can spin the part up to 2,000 revolutions per minute. We machine parts that are a half inch in diameter all the way up to 6 feet in diameter. This operation would normally take 35 minutes to complete, but sped up 64 times, it only takes seconds. This is the milling operation. Unlike a lathe, the tool spins and the part is stationary. These tools will spin up to 10,000 revolutions per minute and drill a hole through solid steel in seconds. Holes are drilled and tapped in this part to install threads for bolts. A key seater is used to install a keyway that maintains the alignment of a shaft through the gear. The teeth are made with a hobbing machine. The cutter spins perpendicular to the part, staying perfectly in sync to cut the correct number of teeth according to the operator's programming. After the teeth are cut, we deburr and remove any sharp edges that are left on the gear. We stamp our company name and part number for tracking purposes. Here's the owner Dave! Next we flame hard on the teeth. We throw flames at the part until it reaches about 1400 degrees Fahrenheit and the teeth start to glow orange. Once the temperature, the gear gets rapidly cooled which hardens the steel and makes it last longer. The final operation is to package the gear to protect it from damage. Any blemishes will cause the gear to not function properly. Displayed here are examples of parts we produce. We hold tolerances within one sixth the width of a human hair. Edgerton gear is built upon quality, service, and value. So, so that's a gear shop, and it's radically different from what it was uh, going back 30 or 40 years ago. And I, I want to start off just by kind of sharing my story and giving you an idea of, of why I'm actually in a gear shop. So I grew up in this very dirty machine shop, um, started working in the shop when I was age five, uh, running equipment by the time I was seven, nine, grew up, uh, ran equipment all the way through high school. And by the time I got to be uh, out of high school, not only was I drinking a lot, um, like my dad, but also I was, I was working full time in the machine shop. I had no clue what I wanted to do with my life. I didn't do very well in, in school. Teachers really didn't consider me to be college material. Um, 
really had no sense of purpose or no or any sense of direction. So at age 19, uh, God got a hold of me in a in a pretty dramatic way, and it was one of those road to Damascus uh, experiences where pretty much in an instant, you know, your your life has changed, and you know that uh, you you matter, and that Jesus has a hold of you, and now the question is, what am I going to do with it? So. Long story short, I kind of ran away from home. I didn't think a machine shop had a, a person could really serve God in a machine shop. So I, I guess the first question I'll ask all of you is, in, in the church today, if you really have a heart for God and you are really excited about serving him, what's the traditional career path? What, what are you supposed to do? The pastor <laughs> pastor, pastor supposed to be a missionary. A missionary. Pastor, yeah. missionary, yeah. Or at least a Sunday school teacher or something. What, what else? Did I hear any other comments? Youth pastor. So that's pretty much the, the track that I took. Um, I really didn't know anything about proper church, church etiquette. So uh, I started volunteering in our youth group. And all I knew was to read my Bible and to pray and to sing. And I wasn't a very good singer, but I tried. And uh, as people kind of coached me, Pretty soon I became working in our youth group, and then I got a, uh, I moved out to California with Athletes in Action, uh, Campus Crusades, Athletes in Action. And as things continued to develop, I found myself uh, volunteering in a large megachurch to college students, which was quite humorous because I had never been to college, and I was, I think, at age 21, 22 at that point. Um, but I was kind of the token Wisconsin hick um, in Southern California where what damage could I do? There was only about 10 college students. Um, the problem is, again, I didn't know anything and just read my Bible, tried to teach what I was reading at the time. And within a year or so, the group was 125, 150. And um, it was a very, very exciting time, but I had a pretty major burnout experience where I was way in over my head. The, the church staff didn't know what to do with, with myself as, as well as a couple other youth pastors. And so it was this experience where, hold it, God, I don't get it. I thought if to really serve you, I needed to be a pastor in the church, and yet it became one of the most painful experiences literally of my life. And they sent me to a psychologist. They, they thought there was something majorly wrong with me because of, uh, of uh, for whatever reason, I, at, at 23, I couldn't handle all the stress. And uh, that psychologist didn't know what was wrong with me, so they sent me to another one. They sent me to a third one. Now, when, you've, when you're on your third psychologist or counselor at, at that age, uh, it sends a pretty strong message that there's something wrong with me. And uh, so the church became a very, very painful place for me. So then my, my next option was, well, Lord, if I can't serve you in the church, maybe I should, I should be in missions. And I, I was going to go to a language school in Guatemala to learn Spanish and, and possibly pursue being a missionary. Fortunately, God intervened again. I met my, my son's mother um, and uh, met her on a short-term mission trip to Mexico. A little over a year later, we were married. But my faith was kind of shipwrecked at that point. And we had started a home group. Um, it, it's like I didn't, I didn't really give up on God, but I was frustrated with church. God def definitely didn't give up on me. And we started a home group, and, and that went really, really well, and it grew. And everybody said, well, Dave, you need to be a pastor, because if you're going to really serve God, you need to be a pastor. Too bad that you had a painful experience, but you need to be a pastor. So what's the next step if you're supposed to be a pastor? I'm going to ask that question. Run. Run? <laughs> Run. <Yeah>. Well... <laughs> I kind of did. Um, you go to Bible school. <laughs> you go to Bible school, exactly. So I went up to Regent College. So on the advice of a, of a mentor, he said, go up to Regent College and, and take a year to figure out what you believe and why. And, and you need to meet a man named Paul Stevens. And Paul Stevens took me under his wing, and this was back in 1990 and 91. And so I, I thought I'd go to... Bible College, that theological graduate school for a year. Um, so I got up to Regent College, and after a year, the, the second some, and I was still pretty angry. I was frustrated, not knowing what I was supposed to do, but really not wanting to, to be a pastor. 
So I took a course from Paul um, and another professor, and it was one of those courses that, that look at your personality, your, your gifting, your experiences, and it's really, it, it's really supposed to help you to figure out what your calling is. And I, at the end of the semester, we got all the results back, and true story, uh, the results came back that said I was ideally gifted and positioned to run a small manufacturing company, family owned. And I literally screamed because that was the last place in the, on the planet. I was willing to go to anywhere in the world, but God just don't bring me back to Edgerton here because when I left, it was literally the, 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 the darkest and most depressing place on the planet. Um, my dad had a quarter barrel of beer in the lunchroom refrigerator. Um, so uh, the staff drank a lot. Every, every noon hour, they'd go down to the local tavern and, and drink three, four, five beers. They'd have a party after work. There's pornography uh, everywhere in the shop, stacks of it in the lunchroom. And I couldn't possibly figure out, Lord, why would you bring me back to a place that was so painful, that was so dark, that was so void of in my mind of, of anything to do with God. So basically at that point, um, I went back and, and I told my wife, I said, uh, I think God may be calling us back to Wisconsin to go back to the family business. So Paul helped us put together a ministry project and Regent College didn't really have a, a, a ministry project like this at the time where your thesis would actually be a field study and it would be an application of, of, uh, taking your theological education and, and actually applying it. And this is the question that I was supposed to ask and figure out. In what ways can a Christian manager affect the relational health of a family by addressing the overlapping systemic factors, family and business, in a time of gener generational transition in a small family owned and run machine shop? So it sounds kind of academic, but basically it's saying, as a Christian, can I come back and help the family be healthy? And by how I manage the, the, the business, can that help change the relational dynamics with my dad, with my mom, with my sisters? The first year um, was pretty brutal. Christian uh, fellowship at the time, uh, people were questioning why we would possibly come back to a, a family business. In fact, a lot of our our closest Christian friends at the time accused us in a nice, in a nice way of selling out. Um, why in the world, if I had a pastor, pastoral call in my life, was I going back to the family business? Um, that, that could not be God's will, um, basically is what they're saying. So we survived the first year, and we got into year two. Um, I had a pretty major coup with three, three of the employees. Uh, they tried starting their own business by breaking into uh, computer records. Um, undermining the leadership and, and the entire business. Uh, they left out of the 17 employees at that time. Within a couple of years, there was only about five of them that still remained. After those two years, I kind of joked that those two years were hell and then it got worse. Uh, for literally the next six, seven, eight years, um, completely burned out, too much stress, um, very, very little support from the Christian community. Kids were being born, and uh, my mom and dad were really struggling. My dad was trying to retire, but he didn't know what to do with himself. Uh, it, was a, it was a completely cultural uh, kind of change throughout the whole company. My hope at that time was I'd only be here for maybe five years and then figure out what we were supposed to do for the rest of our lives to really serve God. Um, but that's, that was 20, 26 years ago. And uh, the funny part is I'm still here. And God made it very clear that this is where I need to be planted. And this is, uh, this is where the king I need to learn what the kingdom. And that, that uh, seeking God is not just in the church. In fact, God needs us in the world. And, and even little small uh, machine shops that seemingly have uh, no, really no role in the kingdom. So my, I guess my story over the 20 some years has, has kind of evolved. My theology has come to the point where I can't imagine doing things more, um, more fruitful for the kingdom than running this little gear shop. Um, it's not just, 
making gears. Gears are, are needed all over the world. <laughs> let, let me ask a question real quick. Have, we, have you read uh, Van Duzer's book so yet? Has that been on the reading list? On the reading list, but I, some of them may not have read it yet. Those of you who have, do you remember the two main points of what business is or what, what, how it can be used in Van Duzer's book? One of his main points is that business allows, uh, it provides goods and services and allows communities to thrive. Okay. So what, what I interpret that to mean is, is that we would not have civilization, and I often tell our students this, civilization would not exist without manufacturers, without people making things, building things, growing things, creating things. Um, I often joke that we'd be, if it wasn't for uh, you know, a good theology of work and manufacturing technology, we'd all be beating things with, killing things with sticks. Well, the second one is to provide a meaningful employment. And it sounds very, very simple, but we were all created to work. Work existed before the fall. And we often talk about work with thistles and thorns and the sweat of our labor. But if, if we read our Bibles carefully, work is really a gift. It gives us a sense of purpose. And, and we were all created to create, to co-create, to, to build, to do something meaningful. And so the idea of creating jobs and giving people meaningful employment is a, is a fantastic responsibility, but, a great, and a, but it's a gift. So in, in business, when I, when I started to realize that my job running the shop is, is just as much a form of ministry as being a pastor or working in a church, I, I came to view my, my shop, as Larry said earlier, as a congregation where God has is, is entrusted uh, a whole group of people and their families uh, for their livelihoods here at Edgerton Gear. So now that's a huge responsibility I need to start weighing seriously and say, well, I don't get to, if I was a pastor in the church, I might, I might uh, get to spend one to three hours a week, maybe a little bit more with them. But here in the business, we're together 40, 50 hours a week, you know, 50 weeks a year. And so we have a, a, often a deeper sense of community than I've often experienced in churches because uh, you see the good, bad, and the ugly when you have to work with somebody, you know, 40, 50 hours a week. You see the ups, the up times, the down times, and, it's, and it provides a lot of opportunities just to walk with each other. So it's, it's been, so the other part of the evolution for me of my theology is and I write a, a little bit about it in the book, but when Jesus says in, in Matthew 6, um, and we, we, I'm sure we all know the, the passage, but seek first his kingdom and his, you know, God's kingdom and his righteousness. I never really considered what that means, but I want to throw out the question to everybody. What do you think that means in terms of your job? Seek his kingdom and his righteousness. What, what is, if, if Jesus was talking to you specifically in where you're at in your life and your work, what would, how does that apply, this word righteousness and seeking his kingdom? The, the primary change that's occurred in me is an expanding understanding of the kingdom. Um, I think 20 years ago, I would have looked back at you straight face and equated the kingdom for the most part with um, the church mm. and, and its, its expression as a local entity with a physical address. I, yeah. I, and so I would have, I would have said... Uh, seek first uh, the needs and responsibilities of your local church and these other things will be added to you. My understanding is broadening and I, I'm trying to I'm actually literally scratching my head trying to think about what this means for the place I work now. It's a great place to work but um, I'm trying to think about this within the context of my life, what I need to be doing here to, to make this a better place to work. Yeah. Uh, and how the kingdom how the kingdom can be brought into this environment many of us have been in a place in life where it's like what do i do now what what is my calling where do i go and there is no help there so um i just see work as a blessing i wish i had taken this class like 20 years ago mm. it would have cut some of the heartache and some of the shortfalls <laughs> <laughs> that you know some of the pits that i jumped into because you really your ego gets into it. Your pride steps up. 
And, you know, ego is easing God out. And it's not about seeking his kingdom. Seeking the kingdom means you first must acknowledge that he's blessed you to be here. This is where you are to prosper. This is where he's planted you. See your job as a blessing through him, and he'll guide you on through it. Yeah. Amen. When I, when I wrestle with that verse, seek his kingdom and his righteousness, um, I don't know if any of you have read Dallas Willard's book, A Divine Conspiracy, but he defines righteousness uh, in that book as true inner goodness. You know, so when, he, so when Jesus says, and, and the, the term in Greek is dikaiosune, and, in, and it's used five times throughout the Sermon on the Mount. And so Jesus keeps saying that our, our, our righteousness, our true inner goodness needs to exceed those of the Pharisees. And he says prostitutes will get in before many of you because their righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees. And Jesus comes to us and says, seek God's true inner goodness. Seek his kingdom. Let his true inner goodness come through you and see what impact that makes in your sphere of influence. And so I, I, in the book, I actually, I, I write quite a bit about it because in my mind in the last, you know, 15 years, especially the thought keeps going through my head is if, if I am God's agent here in this little machine shop, what does it look like for his true inner goodness to come through me and how I treat my customers, my vendors, um, my, my staff, um, the world is broken. It's cynical. It's greedy. It's corrupt. Um, we all get beaten down, it, it, you know, constantly. What if we all started thinking, Lord, how could your true inner goodness come through me to influence whatever sphere of influence that you've given me, whatever station of life that you've, you've put me in, how can my, your true inner goodness flow through me and make a difference in those around me and, and the product that I'm doing in my, in my work. And I think that's been the big game changer for me is, is to start to look at my business in that sense, that our world is in desperate need of some inner goodness. And that's really what Jesus came to and pronounced the kingdom, is that the, the world needs some, some goodness. And we are as agents of that goodness. First and foremost, I think of a kingdom as a place where the king's will is sovereign mm. and everybody else is working hard to ensure that the king reaps the maximum benefit. Yeah. So um, seeking the kingdom to me means that I have to seek his will concerning the, I, the, 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 the kind of work that I'm doing or uh, the kind of position that I'm occupying. What would he be doing? How would he be doing it? And that, in my view, is what seeking the kingdom or righteousness is all about. Being right with God, um, right uh, with, with his will, in alignment with his will. And, and that's, that sense of rightness has almost infinite opportunities throughout a, a work day. Are we, sure. right with, are we right with each other? You know, are we right with the job that I'm doing? Am I right with my customers? And that sense of rightness uh, <laughs> the world desperately needs. I, I think business today has become so, so competitive, so cutthroat, um, so desperate at times when, and, and greedy that that sense of rightness, sometimes people don't know how to, how to respond to, to a, a business or, or any of us when they do work, when we do the right thing on a consistent basis. Dave, can I can I ask you um, the the damage or the, the struggle, the carnage, whatever you want to call those years before you surrendered to this this service? Um, can you comment on how it changed you? I mean, I'm I'm curious to know. Um, you know, I guess I'm assuming God's working on the workplace, but he's also working on the worker. Mm. He's working on the boss. He's working Absolutely. on the owner. So I'm just curious if you can comment briefly on how you think it's, how you think it's transformed you as a person. That's a great question. And I'm going to turn it around on, and Caleb's smiling because he knows I'm going to ask him. Growing up, I think I, I feel like I got the most of the angry dad um, just because yep. I remember it better than my brothers do because I was older. Um, but I'd have nightmares growing up of dad being a lion, 
like mm-hmm. chasing me and just being so angry, like just roaring at me. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it never got like physically abusive, but it was just, he'd come home and we'd just be like, what's dad going to be like today? Is he going to be angry and just tell us go, to go straight to bed or, um, I don't know, it was just always kind of up, up in the air. Uh, but as the years went on, I guess, um, he started coaching our swim team and he started setting time aside in our day when the business started, uh, when the business started doing better and he felt like he could leave there. Um, a little bit, he started playing more of a role in our lives. Um, and you know, the best years of my high school years were when he was coaching our swim team, mm-hmm. uh, or just being at home and he'd stay, he'd spend more time with us. Uh, and through the years, he's just gotten more gentle, I guess <laughs> I would say, I don't know, uh, to put it honestly, right. yeah. um, but just, just more, more loving and kind of understanding and, and guiding and, and taking more of a mental role than just being the angry dad that doesn't want to deal with us and just wants to go to sleep. I really, I really appreciate you sharing that because, uh, you know, just being honest and vulnerable, but I think the damage growing up in an alcoholic home for one um, was difficult. That my, my role model, I, I love my dad deeply, but his father was an alcoholic. So he struggled what it was to be a father and, and uh, he did a fairly good job, but he, he fell short in a lot of ways too. So I was trying to figure out what it is to be a dad. But on another level, the way I started off tonight was sharing my experience in church and this expectation that if we're serving God, we need to be working in a church or a missionary or or whatever. And I think those imposed expectations, some of them were self-imposed on what I need to be to be significant and valuable in God's eyes played a huge role because since I wasn't in church and I was in this little machine shop that, that other Christians said had no value, you know, in God's eyes, I was sent the message very clearly that God doesn't need gear makers. He doesn't need administrators. He doesn't need woodworkers. And, and for me as a machinist desperately wanting to serve God, um, it was a, it was a tough message. So I was filled with this anger that I, that I had no sense of purpose or no sense of, significance in God's eyes and when he started to get through to me that I you are right where I want you and I love you more than ever that's when I think a lot of the anger um, and that sense of surrender went wow if this is where I'm at um, and this is where God wants me there's freedom in that I want to show you another video because you've heard you know kind of the journey some of the pain that we've been through and and, uh, where we were and I want to fast forward to where we're at now as a company because it's, uh, I would have never dreamed ever that we would be doing what we're doing now with uh, high school students and being able to share our story and be a part of, of helping young people find their place. Contact! Yeah, about another 30 seconds, they'll fight you. In 2014, it was estimated that there were 600,000 unfilled high-tech manufacturing jobs in the U.S. alone. I would bet it's double today. It is so creative. It is so high-tech on, on so many levels that there are more opportunities than people could possibly imagine. So we've got guys that are are 23, 24, buying houses, buying cars. Um, They don't have any debt, highly successful, and yet we don't have enough of them. We don't have enough young people coming to the trades to keep civilization even functioning. So I often tell our students, they're gonna be like free agents, you know, like in the sports world, where they're gonna be able to name their wage. My job as the owner and, and, uh, and basically president of the company, keeper of the culture, is what can I do to help everybody be successful? How's the job going? Uh, good. So rather than having a model where everybody serves me and serves you know, the, the big guys, you flip that upside down and my job is to serve everybody else. And it started to dawn on me that some of the biggest challenges our culture faces, we have so many students out there today that have no sense of purpose, no sense of where they're going in life. The problem is today, in my opinion, character is lacking in a very, very big way. So now the question is, can you teach character and skills? My assumption is yes, because every person on the planet 
has, besides their basic needs, need two things. And I don't care what culture, I don't care what age, every one of us has a desperate need for two things. And it's having a sense of purpose, and it's having a sense of relationship. We need to be doing things in community. There's a, there's a Jewish proverb that goes, I don't know how far back, but the Jewish proverb is, whoever, a father who does not teach his son a trade is akin to teach him in robbery. Hey Clayton, come on and join. Why don't you grab a chair? We're just going around what, we're, what we learned this week. So we developed a course called Craftsman with Character that basically flips the educational model. And instead of putting a kid in a classroom four days or five days a week, we have them in a class one day a week and we explore the world views. You know, I've heard you say you don't think you're smart, which I think that's ridiculous. At your age, if somebody would have come up to me and said, you know, you're really good at this or this or this. You know, that's what I needed to hear at your age. What, what do you think is going to make you happy? You think it's going to be money? You think it's going to be prestige, power, whatever? Um, what are you gifted at? What do you value in life? What do you need that's going to be, what skills do you need to be successful? What qualities, character qualities, virtues do you need to be successful and be employable? The Craftsman course also partners with the local high schools. So we have a tech ed teacher that actually joins us in our class. So they're getting school credit for it. What do I want to be when I grow up? The best, worst question in the world. Because nobody knows what they want to be when they grow up, right? You see how you're melting through? Keep that tip on top of that material. The Craftsman character is, is the future and it, it was the past at the same time. We've had this around for a long time. It's called apprenticeship. Being able to learn from other individuals that came before you is an amazing thing. We don't have these kids hanging out anymore with their parents to learn a trade, to, to learn a skill, a valuable skill to move forward. And so we discuss all that in the classroom, but then four days a week, we put the students out in the shop floor being mentored or job shadowing, uh, skilled tradesmen already. People are really, really good at their jobs. It's this job shadowing where an older experienced person mentors and teaches a younger person. What are you getting on that? Or actually, Healy, why don't you tell me what that reads? 475. I can see it from here, that's correct. Intuitively, the kids are absorbing those character qualities that we talk about in class because they see those character qualities being modeled on the shop floor. You could often even say that, that apprenticeship equals friendship. And, and bring them to a, a place of health and competence because you care for that student, you care for that person you're mentoring. Oh, we're hitting a little bit right up here. Oh, yeah. We have to bring that center drill down just a little bit. Best part about it being a craftsman, at the end of the day, I can look and say, this is what I did. And I know I made a difference. I did, I did something worthwhile. And you end your day and you go, yeah, it was a good day. I matter. It's kind of funny to me that uh, 26 years later, uh, when I started off being what I thought I was supposed to be a youth pastor, <laughs> I get to come back to it and be a youth pastor here in the business and uh, penetrate the public schools and uh, help these kids hopefully find their path.